You're watching the Health Channel, all health, all the time. I am Cynthia Demas. Let me ask you a question, or a few. Do you have trouble falling asleep? Do you take cat naps during the day? Do you toss and turn and wake up throughout the night? Have you been told you snore? If you answered yes to two or more of those questions, you may have a sleep disorder. And that's okay because we're gonna give you some great advice on how to deal with it. We are here with sleep expert, Dr. Timothy Grant, medical director of Baptist Sleep Center at Baptist Outpatient Services. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Wide-eyed and bushy-tailed, aren't you? I'm happy to be here, Cynthia. <laughs> we're happy to have you here. Let's start off the bat. Why is sleep so important for our health? Well, it turns out that that's a question that everybody asks. It, it, people think that, oh my gosh, you just go to sleep, your brain quiets down, and you wake up in the morning, and that's all that happens. But really what happens is your brain is often more active at night than it is during the daytime. Oh. You use more sugar at night in your brain. You use more oxygen at different parts of the night in your brain than you would when you're awake. We now know that there are parts of the night that you actually clean out the waste products from your brain that you can't do during the daytime. Mm. So you have to be able to sleep to be able to rejuvenate your brain, to be, to be able to consolidate memories, to consolidate your energy, to feel refreshed and rejuvenated for the next day. What's fascinating is you saw the picture of the, of the puppy and the, and the kitty mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning. You know, mammals all have these stages of sleep, but there are certain mammals, Cynthia, that, that do things differently than we can so do. So cute. You, they, for instance, when you look at your dog or cat, you can see they're going through different stages of sleep. They can dream, they can toss around. There are actually dolphins that can sleep with one side of their brain at one time and then swim and switch to the other side of the brain being asleep. So they can switch different wow. parts of their brain being, being asleep at different times. And researchers are trying to figure out how this can apply to us and how humans may be able to benefit from this different kind of research. So sleep is very, very important. Wow, that's amazing. So Dr. Grant is a neurologist, but your specialty is in sleep medicine. How did that come about? So I was one of those doctors who loved just about everything I ever took. You know, you take rotations when you're in training. And I would come home and I would say, oh, I'm going to be an obstetrician. Oh, I'm going to be a surgeon. Oh, I'm going to be this or that. And my last rotation was a neurologist uh, in neurology. And I realized that that interacted with every different specialty because the nervous system mm -hmm. has to do with every different specialty. And then several years ago, I took a sleep course in Stanford, California. That's one of the meccas of sleep medicine. And I just fell in love with it. And I just love being specialized, ultra specialized, that I can help doctors and I can help patients. And I realized that sleep medicine is one of those things that you can truly, truly, truly help patients and improve the quality of their lives. I think that you're in the majority. I think a lot of people are obsessed with sleep and yeah. learning how to sleep better. I, I, I definitely think that. What contributes to our lack of sleep? Well, you can imagine, you know, even us, I'll give my perfect example. I, I had a nephew ask me recently, he works for IBM, and he said, hey, do you think that all this technology is a good thing or a bad thing? And I said, well, it's actually both. And the example is, last night I was working till 1030, working on patient studies and scoring things through the computer. I would never have done that many years ago when I didn't have computer access to charts and to the laboratory. So that's not a good thing. That's one of the things I'm going to tell you later in our discussion. That's not a healthy thing to do, to be okay. up so late and working and to have your brain so active before you can quiet down and go to sleep. So our, our active work schedules, the fact that we work so long, the fact that we're exposed to light exposure from TVs, from computer screens, from telephones. We even know now that the alerting message on your telephone, just the light from your telephone, can interrupt your sleep at night. And the fact that we work harder during the week and we try to make up for that on the weekends, that wreaks havoc on your sleep system as well. Mm. So there are all of these different things that are different than they were years ago. The, the innovation of shift work many, many decades ago, and the fact that so many of us work shift work, Cynthia, is a terrible thing. Shift work is a risk factor for almost every single illness uh, as related to sleep. And so there are many different things in our, in our modern world, including traveling and jet lag and, and uh, working so hard. So all those different things can so, contribute to poor sleep. What do you mean by shift work? So shift work is typically when somebody's not working at the typical time when the normal body would want to be asleep. Okay. So for instance, the thing that makes us go to sleep at night is you're awake during the day and you've been awake for so long that you get tired, you want to go to sleep. But the other thing is when the sun goes down, there's a natural phenomenon that your brain makes melatonin, this mm -hmm. natural substance from deep inside of your brain that kind of hops over to another part of your brain and tells it to quiet down and go to sleep. But if there's light exposure, when you go to work and there's lights on in the middle of the night and somebody's working the 11 to 7 shift at night, 
they're supposed to be asleep. They're not supposed to be awake. So you're fighting this natural instinct to want to be asleep, and it's hard for your body to adapt to that. So shift work is typically not that seven to three or nine to three or nine to five uh, work hour during the daytime. It's working late in the afternoon, or typically the worst is working late at night, that 11 to seven shift. And that wreaks havoc on you. Works havoc on, right. your, on and your there's body. No, is there, do you ever get used to it? No, you don't. You know, there are some people that are better uh, at it. Yeah. You know, we now know, this is an interesting phenomenon. You know, when I was in college, I used to play piano at night in bars. Mm -hmm. I like and that. it sounds kind of silly, but I would, I would go and I'd play piano until the middle of the night and then go to class early in the morning. And I thought I was a night owl, but I'm not a night owl. I didn't function that well, and it kind of caught up with me. And I realized that as I got older, I'm really kind of a, a lark. I do better in the morning. Mm -hmm. I do better with my time. And it turns out we now know historically, Cynthia, that genetically people can be more predisposed to be a night owl or be a lark. Okay. And people who are night owls, you can imagine, they do better with shift work than somebody who's predisposed to feel better in the morning. But as it turns out, after you do many, many years, you can get a little bit used to it, but it still is a risk factor for all different sorts of illnesses. All right, so hopefully you're just playing the piano at brunch now instead of I play for my hours. I play for my wife and my grandchildren. They're, okay. the, they're the best audience for me. So. <laughs> and and uh, during the daylight hours. What yeah. are the stages of sleep? So that's a, that's a great question too. You know, people think, as I said, if you were sitting around now, 4th of July is coming up, and you sat around with your family and you said, hey, what do you think happens when you go to sleep? And they say, well, you know, you kind of shut your eyes and you become unresponsive and you wake up. But that's not really what happens. You go through different stages of sleep. You go through light sleep and then a little bit of deeper sleep and then what we call REM sleep, rapid mm -hmm. eye movement sleep. And that's when you dream. And these cycles happen about every 90 uh, minutes during the night and you cycle in and out of those different things, and you need to cycle into that to have the refreshing sleep and the rejuvenating sleep and for these different things to happen to help you feel better in the morning. Okay, and there are some common uh, sleep disorders here, starting with insomnia. Yeah. Is that, how common is that? You hear about it's, insomnia, but do you really know, well, you know a lot of people with insomnia. <laughs> do well, that's what I us? see. So I see it very commonly in my practice, obviously, because I'm a sleep specialist. But right. if, if you uh, just looked at the general population, between nine and 10% of the population has what we call chronic insomnia. That okay. means that it's lasting for more than a month. It's been going on for a long, long time. But it's very common that if you talk to, you know, 100 people on the, on the sidewalk, 50% of them would probably say at some time in the last year, they had problems with their sleep. So if you okay. look at this little graphic here, this chart, these are the common things we see in my practice, in a sleep specialist practice. We see insomnia, we'll okay. talk about that a little bit later. We talk about sleep apnea, trouble breathing. And, We're gonna and, really get into that, that after the break. Periodic limb movements, uh -huh. we'll talk about that, and restless leg syndrome. REM sleep behavior disorder. So what that means is you're actually doing things at night that you, sh that you don't really want to be doing. And instead of dreaming a dream, you actually act out the dream and do something physical that oh. you really don't want to do. And then narcolepsy and hypersomnolence refers to being excessively sleepy during the daytime. So the things that a sleep specialist does is typically what we do is we deal with trouble sleeping at night or being too sleepy during the daytime. So we can see people who say, gee, I can't sleep at night, or I'm gasping or choking, mm -hmm. or I can see a pilot, an airline pilot, who says, listen, I've got to see you because I've got to prove that I'm not sleepy during the daytime. Or uh, somebody who's a metro driver or a bus driver mm -hmm. and being able to stay awake and alert during the day <laughs> so they don't have an accident. So we see people with do both different uh, phenomena, nighttime and daytime sleep issues. Wow, so we've got over the different types of sleep disorders, but how do you know if you have any sleep problems? Let's take a look at Dr. Uh, Grant's questions to ask your bed partner. Here we go. So these are simple questions. These are This is something I came up with my uh, on my own for my patients. Instead of having a long list of endless questions, these are simple things. So do you snore or stop breathing when you're sleeping? Okay. And we'll talk about that, how important that is. Do you have restless legs? Are your legs jerking around and keeping you from falling asleep or waking you up in the middle of the night? Do you act out your dreams? Are you just dreaming a dream or do you actually do something physically that you wouldn't want to do? Do you exhibit violent behavior? Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about that, things that can be very, very worrisome and dangerous at night, but are very, very treatable and excessive daytime sleepiness, being too sleepy during the daytime. So if you have any of these things, that's the reason why you should see a sleep specialist. All right, and there are some uh, like d diseases that are, affect that are associated with sleep disorders. Absolutely. So we now know that, um, here, here's another uh, slide that's very, very relevant. 
We now know that anything that interrupts or what we call fragments sleep can cause and predispose to different mm -hmm. illnesses. And there's five major ones that are, that are very, very serious. That's heart disease, cardiovascular disease, or irregular heart rhythms. Uh, there is hypertension, which is high blood pressure. There is cerebrovascular disease, which is stroke diabetes mm -hmm. de and depression. And now we know that, it's, that sleep issues can be a risk factor for every type of cancer, right. as well as eye problems like glaucoma. And uh, are there, how does it sleep affect your heart health? I know you we just touched on that a little bit. So one of the things that we said rejuvenates you, makes you feel better during right. the daytime, is getting a good night's sleep. But if something is interrupting your sleep, and in another segment we're gonna talk about disruptions of sleep and how your nervous system can actually jolt you from one stage of sleep to another stage of sleep. And when those things happen, it can put a tremendous stress on your heart and what we call your cardiovascular system. So it can not only predispose you to heart attack, but it can jerk you into an irregular heart rhythm like atrial fibrillation. And all the big uh, literature now in the last several years, it says if you have an irregular heart rhythm like atrial fibrillation, mm -hmm. it's very, very important to make sure that you don't have a sleep problem because if you treat the sleep problem, you're much less likely to have persistent irregular heartbeat, much less likely to have a heart attack or a stroke. All right, Dr. Grant, getting into our sleep disorders and what we need to know. This deals a lot with men specifically, so we're gonna get more into that. How do you know if you are one of the 18 million Americans with sleep disorder? Dr. Grant is going to explain. Please visit our website, allhealthallthetime.com. Submit your questions there for Dr. Grant or for any of our experts. And also there, you can learn more about the Health Channel on South Florida's PBS. We'll be right back. In late 2010, I entered a BMX dirt jumping contest and took a hard slam. And I'd done the trick a thousand times, I suffered a traumatic brain injury. Now I'm not telling you not to send it, not to go out there and get it done. But what I am saying is learn about brain injury and how to prevent it. Our sport is cool enough, you can wear a helmet. T-cell therapy is a revolutionary new treatment for cancer. Healthcare companies developing CAR T immunotherapy use Thermo Fisher's DynaBeads technology to isolate, activate, and expand T-cells that have been genetically engineered to recognize and fight cancer cells. We're taking the patient's own cells and enriching those cells to fight the cancer. For more, go to thermofisher.com slash CTS. C stands for courage. Collaboration. Compassion. And sometimes even cuddly. At Miami Cancer Institute, C also stands for cure. World-class cancer care right here at home. Learn more at MiamiCancerInstitute.com. C stands for cutting edge research, clinical trials, and collaboration. Creating breakthrough treatments as Florida's only member of the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Alliance. At Miami Cancer Institute, C also stands for cure. World-class cancer care right here at home. Learn more at MiamiCancerInstitute.com. Welcome back to the Health Channel, all health, all the time. I am Cynthia Demas. Joining us this hour is Dr. Timothy Grant, Medical Director of the Baptist Sleep Center at Baptist Outpatient <laughs> Services. We are talking about sleep issues, yeah. things people deal with. Have you seen this naked guy? <laughs> yeah, I didn't make that up. Take a look at this. This naked guy right here. What is happening in this picture? Oh my goodness, I'm glad he's running away from the camera. So this is actually, Cynthia, this is a patient of mine who, uh, I call it the, could I borrow a cup of sugar please? Okay. So this is an actual patient who came to me and he's, I didn't take this picture by the way. So he, he comes to me and he says, hey listen doc, I used to have sleep apnea, which we're gonna talk about. Okay. And I stopped using it many, many years ago. But I'm very, very worried because I just had an episode where I awakened, and when I awakened, I was standing naked in front of my neighbor's next door uh, doorway, knocking on the door, 
asking for a cup of sugar. And she says to me, she says, hey, uh, nice to see you, but what are, what you, are doing you doing here? And I was completely, he says to me, oh my gosh, I was embarrassed, I didn't know what was going on. And as it turns out, we'll explain that when there are disruptions of your sleep at night that we'll talk about sleep apnea, it can actually trigger abnormal activity like sleepwalking or sleep talking or doing bizarre things that you don't really want to do. Wait, wait, and wait, the wait. nice story about that, okay, we okay. treated him and then he never had any more episodes. Okay, so wait, this is something that builds up. So if you're not sleeping, what is like, gotta connect a lot of dots here. If you're not sleeping well, then you can run around naked and not so under. so let's talk about what uh, why, what is sleep apnea and what's actually happening okay so the typical story is somebody will come to me and they'll say listen I'm snoring and I think I may have sleep apnea so the answer is gosh snoring is like a big red flag to us as sleep doctors it can be something minor like the upper airway mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh -huh. Just kind of old-fashioned snoring from a deviated septum or congestion or allergies, but it just makes noise. It's not dangerous. But sleep apnea is more dangerous. It means as you go into deeper and deeper sleep, your throat becomes so relaxed that it closes off like a kinked hose. And the snoring's coming from here. Okay. <gasps> So when it's that a happens, different sound. Different sound. Okay. But you can't tell for sure without doing a sleep study. So typically that closes off, not enough air gets into your lungs, not enough oxygen goes to your brain, and your brain says, hey, come on, you're not breathing, you gotta wake up. So in order to get you to wake up, Cynthia, your brain gives you a sympathetic nervous system battery jolt to jerk you from one stage of sleep into a lighter stage of sleep. Okay. And in a lighter stage of sleep, you open up your throat and you start to breathe again. Okay. But not only can that put you at risk for other illnesses like we talked about, heart disease and high blood pressure and diabetes, mm -hmm. see where that arrow is? That means where the throat is closing off back there. And when that closes off, that's what I was saying, not enough air gets in, not enough oxygen gets in, and your brain is triggered to wake you up. And those nervous system jolts to wake you up can then actually trigger abnormal behavior like sleepwalking or, so, these, or these things. So if, if, do you have to snore to have sleep apnea? Uh, no, that's one of the one of the myths. So the okay. classic story is a big, heavy, obese sumo right. wrestler that you see in the airport, and he's snoring and he's dozing off in his chair. But a third of the patients who have sleep apnea are slender and skinny. Okay. It's more common in men, but we see it in women too. It becomes more common in, in women after menopause. Two of my grandchildren had sleep apnea. Had, had had sleep apnea, and they in children it actually works. They had their tonsils taken out, and they did much better. They yeah. actually cured their sleep apnea. That doesn't work so well in adults, uh, but in children, so it can happen at any age, and mm -hmm. it's very important to recognize it. Yep. But the answer to your question is, you can have sleep apnea without snoring. We had my daughter had sleep apnea at the age of five, and our yeah. teacher said she's falling asleep in kindergarten. What's going on? What's going on? Yeah. We got her tonsils taken out. Yeah, there you go. Now it doesn't sound yeah. like a truck is driving through her room anymore. She was a little five-year-old with a loud snore. Yeah, two of so, my grand, two of my grandsons had it. The same, the same as well. So the good news is, fortunately, there's some help for sleep disorders, including sleep apnea. Take a look at this. And almost a third of our lives sleeping. Yet many of us suffer from sleep disorders that prevent us from getting restful sleep, an essential ingredient for good health. These disorders include obstructive sleep apnea, insomnia, and restless leg syndrome. If untreated, sleep disorders can have a major impact on your quality of life. During the night, I will wake up several times. Uh, my wife will complain about my snoring also, uh, she will wake me up because I will stop breathing during the night. Uh, after uh, in the mornings, I will be very tired and I will have to take naps at work. Sometimes I'll go to my car, sometimes I will go in back of the office uh, so I can rest a little bit because it was difficult to continue working the whole day, focusing on everything. It's something really important to do. Sleep studies can pick up abnormalities that can improve your quality of life, including making you less tired, less forgetful, improve concentration, general sense of well-being, but more importantly, can make you medically safer. My wife doesn't complain about my snoring. I don't have to take naps. Uh, I'm very happy and uh, I, it has changed my life uh, for good. All right, and Dr. Grant brought a little uh, show and tell. This is Wilson here, and you're going to show <laughs> us Wilson. what Wilson is wearing. 
So um, as we saw on that patient, that was actually a patient of mine who's okay. done very well with sleep apnea. And the reason I brought this, this prop today is people have the notion that, oh my gosh, this is a horrible thing and I've got to wear this big terrible thing from Silence of the Lambs, you know, that I can't wear <laughs> at night and I'll never be able to do it and it's not romantic. So I always tell people I kid and I say, listen, just make love before you put on the mask and then you'll be fine. <laughs> but the, they come, there are a hundred different masks and, and, our, and our advice is just whatever's comfortable for okay. you. So so this is a typical mask that we use. This is delivers air. It's not oxygen that's coming in, it's just air so it's just because right air has oxygen. Okay. So when the air comes in, it's actually keeping the back of your throat open and it's allowing you to breathe normally and then your brain doesn't keep waking you up at night. But what if you breathe through your mouth? So then there are masks that also the, that can cover the mouth. Okay. Now the re, the, often uh, we can be concerned about and have a mask that covers the mouth, but the only reason we worry about mouth breathing is if it's waking the patient up and making noise noise or if not enough air is getting down through the throat, it's coming back out through the mouth and not being able to take care of the sleep apnea. But it all depends on the individual patient. And typically what I always recommend is whatever is the most comfortable mask for the patient is what turns out to be the best. And this is really light. People, I think, probably don't realize how light this is. They've come, every year they come out with new innovations. This is amazingly light. It's made out of silicone mm -hmm. and it, it literally is just a few ounces. And, and uh, you can barely, yeah, it, feel it. It's just literally like having a rib on and your on your head. So how does it work? You, this plugs so the way that you do where? it is there's another tube. There's okay. a tube that t comes from here, and it actually plugs either into a machine here. So here's a typical CPAP machine, okay. and this shows it's like a clock radio. This again shows how small they are. They're not like a big suitcase. It's fairly small, and they make no noise whatsoever. They're literally totally silent. Oh. The bed partners typically love this because the snoring goes away completely. There's zero snoring, and the machine doesn't really make any noise. This is a machine that's used for travel. I use this when I actually travel okay. uh, with my family and my grandchildren. You, you actually and wear this yourself? I have sleep apnea, so yeah, I've been go. using it every night for 15 years. It keeps me, you know, young and rejuvenated and, right. you know, hopefully. <laughs> Not just the president, so, but right, a, a right, user. A as well. client as well, right. So. so before you get to this, though, you have to do a sleep apnea study. <laughs> Right, so the only way to actually tell, you cannot tell for sure. I've had patients bring in recordings that either mm -hmm. they've recorded their wife or the wife has recorded them, and uh, they'll say, what do you think? Do you think this is sleep apnea? And I'll say, well, gosh, maybe it is. It sounds like it, mm -hmm. but we can't tell for sure without doing a sleep study. So what's so going here, on here? as you can see on the screen, this is called an in-laboratory study. This is patients come into the laboratory there's no needles or pain involved. This is all just paste and, and electrodes that are kind of stuck to the skin like when you have an electrocardiogram. Mm -hmm. You're in a room that's like a hotel room and then in a separate room our uh, technicians are there all night long recording and typically there are 24 different leads that we look at. We look at brainwave activity, we look at breathing through the nose, we look at uh, your heartbeats, we look at your chest moving, your abdomen moving, your leg movements, and uh, all of those different things, and your heartbeats. So we look at all of those things all night long, and literally the thing that you just saw on the screen is every 30 seconds we're examining every single breath on? and every single thing that's going on for the entire night. So it's a very involved process. So do you have to go and sleep at the hospital to do this, or is well, there? Well, there are different forms. So the, the most uh, extensive uh, form of doing a sleep study where we can tell the most information mm -hmm. is an in-laboratory study. Study. And sometimes that's crucial because we need to know brainwave activity for certain disorders. We need to know uh, different things that you can only tell in the laboratory. But now, for the last few years, we actually have tests that are available on a much more simple basis mm -hmm. that you can take home overnight. And that will just monitor your breathing and your oxygen level. But we can do a fairly reasonable diagnosis of sleep apnea, often with just a home study that you take home overnight. It's just a few straps. Uh, very easy to use and you bring it back the next day and we can help uh, to make that diagnosis to treat it properly. Let's talk about a CPAP. Can everyone wear a CPAP? Well, there's different ways to treat sleep apnea. So sleep apnea, as we talked about, is that closing off of the airway. And what I tell people, it's like a garden hose. So if you had a garden hose and you don't pass any water through it, it's easy to kink. If you pass water through a garden hose, Cynthia, it gets stiff, it's harder mm -hmm. to bend the garden hose. So if you pass air through the back of your throat, it keeps your throat open, air goes through, air has oxygen, so it tells the brain, hey, stop waking them up, let them stay asleep. Now the different ways to treat it are losing weight, they say if you lose 10 to 20% of your body weight, sometimes it makes a difference, but a third of the patients who have sleep apnea are skinny, so sometimes it doesn't make a difference. Mm -hmm. The next thing is you can wear a thing in your mouth that we call an oral appliance that actually protrudes your jaw forward. And by moving your jaw forward, it opens up the back of your throat. 
Some people like that. It doesn't work well for severe sleep apnea. It has the risk of what we call TMJ syndrome and moving your teeth around, but that's something that we caution people about. The next thing is surgery, but we rarely do surgery anymore. Surgery here won't work because that's not where, that's not where sleep apnea is. So cleaning out here and cleaning out the uh, deviated septum or turbinates, that's not where sleep apnea is. Sleep apnea is back here. So they used to think, gosh, we'll go back there, we'll ream around the back of your throat, we'll do surgery back there, but it turned out to be horrifically painful and many of the patients still ended up having sleep apnea, so they rarely do that anymore. There's a new surgery called a pacemaker for very select patients. Sounds kind of interesting, but it goes underneath the skin and it has a wire that leads to a nerve that leads to your tongue. Okay. And when you turn it on at night, every time you take a breath, it sticks your tongue out a little bit. And it sounds kind of silly and goofy, but it's for certain patients where opening up their tongue forward can actually open up the back of their airway. Again, that's for only exclusive patients. And then there's CPAP. And CPAP, the acronym CPAP, stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. So it's just air that's going through your throat the way that we described. And there's many different kinds of CPAP machines. So sometimes patients may fail with one type of machine, then they have a more sophisticated machine. So for instance, I use a machine that has a computer actually inside of the machine, and it's constantly adjusting the pressure all night long. So I get different pressures at different times of the night depending on what I need. And I'm kind of a test pilot for all these different kinds of masks, so every time a new mask comes out, I try mm -hmm. them out myself and see how they work. All right, so, so that's a full report, full report. Go. Okay, we're gonna be right back after this. If you're still wondering if you have a sleep disorder, stick around when we come back. Our sleep expert, Dr. Grant, is going to tell us about insomnia. We'll be right back. Dr. Lambert um, invited us to come to this program called Davis Smiles um, to do another surgery for my son's lip. He was born with a cleft in his lip. This is our 16th year and we deal with kids under 18, although we've done some people beyond that. And it started off with cleft lips and then it segued into congenital hand problems, burns, tumors. It's really expanded into a wonderful program. But it is a totally free program and Baptist and Baptist Children's Hospital provides everything. The doctors donate their time, the staff donates their time. It's all done, there is no cost. And, and we wanna emphasize that so that next year we have a whole bunch of people signing up. They're opening a door where, you know, your child's able to grow and to feel better about themselves, you know, and be able to go to school and be around the other kids and not be ashamed. So it's, it's, it's something that you don't wanna turn your back on, you wanna do it. Like millions of Americans, Emma was living with high blood pressure and didn't know it. There were no early warning signs or symptoms. But Emma's heart was working overtime, putting her at risk for heart disease and stroke. Following a physical, Emma was diagnosed with high blood pressure, also called hypertension. People of all backgrounds can develop high blood pressure. Treatments differ based on risk factors, including age and family history. But hypertension can often be controlled with healthy habits and medication when necessary. Eating more fruits and vegetables, following a low-salt diet, exercising regularly, and quitting smoking are often the first lines of defense to control high blood pressure. Your doctor may prescribe one or more medications to help lower your blood pressure to normal. Some rid the body of extra sodium and water. Others reduce the heart rate or relax the blood vessels. Always take medications exactly as prescribed and don't skip doses. While medications can effectively lower blood pressure when taken correctly, each type has potential side effects for some people. You might feel tired or have trouble sleeping. You may experience a dry cough, stuffy nose, leg cramps, frequent urination, or headaches. If you have side effects that don't go away with time, don't just quit taking your medication. Talk with your doctor and pharmacist as there may be other medications or different doses that can control your blood pressure and have fewer or no side effects. Focus on the benefits. Taking your medication regularly will lower high blood pressure and protect your brain, heart, and kidneys from life-threatening consequences like stroke or heart attack, often the first scary signs of hypertension when left untreated. 
Control your blood pressure and reduce your risk by knowing your goal numbers and monitoring your blood pressure at home or at your local pharmacy in between doctor's visits. How's Franny? <laughs> she just graduated from obedience school. Pharmacists play a key role in working with your physician to improve blood pressure management. We can address medication concerns and challenges. So talk to us about your treatments and goals outlined by your doctor. If taking your medication feels like a chore, don't just stop taking it. We can counsel you on working through side effects or determine when you need to see your doctor about possible changes in your medications. And we'll share healthy lifestyle tips to keep you on track. Whether you monitor your blood pressure at home or in the pharmacy, we're here to discuss your numbers and provide guidance. Okay, Emma, you're all set. I'll see you back here soon. All right, welcome back. You're watching the Health Channel, All Health All the Time. I'm Cynthia Demas. Joining us today is Dr. Timothy Grant, a neurologist and medical director of the Baptist Sleep Center at Baptist Outpatient Services. Thanks so much for being here. Well, thank you, Cynthia. A lot of people have problems falling asleep, often because of different life circumstances. Maybe they have a big exam the next day or a big presentation at work, uh, but it could also mean they have insomnia. So what is, how do they know what they, is it insomnia or is it just uh, I'm worried about what have to do tomorrow? So some people can have just that mild few day insomnia. They've come back from a trip, they've had the loss of a loved one, they've had, they're worried about an examination, they're worried about something, even something happy can do it, any kind of mm -hmm. change in your life. But insomnia is just our general term for trouble either getting to sleep, staying asleep, getting up too early in the morning, not being able to get back to sleep, or feeling unrefreshed or any combination. And you can switch. You can say, well, I used to have trouble falling asleep, now I have trouble staying asleep. And you can have all the above and it can kind of change. Uh, it's more common in women. It gets worse after menopause, but it can happen at any age and it can happen in men and women. And uh, the nice thing is, is that it can be very treatable. We'll talk about that. So how much of it is medical and how much of it is mental? So in other words, I, I know if I have to get up at 5 a.m. because I have a flight to catch, I don't sleep well, and I think a lot of people have that problem also. And that, that seems mental, obviously. Yeah. So what, what, how do you know if it's mental or, or medical? So it can actually be both. That's okay. a very good question. It can be absolutely both. So say you have a medical illness. Many of the, if you name any medical illness, any medical illness, I can tell you how it's associated with a sleep problem and insomnia, okay. literally. And so if you think about arthritis, that could keep you up because of pain. If you have high blood pressure, the medicines that you take for high blood pressure could be keeping you up at night. If you have other significant illnesses that you're taking medicines for, it's very classic for different medicines mm -hmm. to be associated with insomnia. And sometimes what we do is all I do is either wean the medicines or I say, hey, why don't you take that medicine in the morning instead of at night? And sometimes that makes a difference. One of the secrets about treating insomnia is kind of correlates with what you're talking about, Cynthia, because if we just give a patient a pill, if I just kind of throw a pill at a patient, mm -hmm. they're not much different a year from now. So what we try to do is all the literature says that the best thing is that what we call cognitive behavioral therapy. And cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, is a fancy schmancy term for a specialized relaxation therapy geared specifically for insomnia. And so it's geared to what you're saying. It's a classic story is, gosh, I wake up at night and I can't turn my thoughts off. Yeah. I'm thinking about the interview I have tomorrow, the yeah. test I have tomorrow, the presentation I have at work that I have to do, and I can't turn my thoughts off. And it turns, off that, it turns out that this cognitive behavioral therapy that's only done by very specialized people, typically psychologists, can help you to train your brain to be able to get back to sleep, to fall asleep, if you wake up too early to a again fall asleep again without using medications. So what we try to do is use the least amount of medications or no medications, mm -hmm. but then there's a whole myriad of different medications that we can use depending on the issue of the patient. There are medicines that help you get to sleep, medicines that help you stay asleep, there are medicines that last for more hours, there are medicines that only last for a couple of hours, and it just depends specifically on the patient. And they all have different side effects, so we have to be very clear with the patient 
how to take the medicines, not to mix them with other medicines, not to mix them with alcohol, and the proper way to take your medicines. Well, because you, you hear a lot about people being concerned that if they start taking some kind of sleep aid that they'll never be able to wean themselves off. That's exactly true. And there are certain medicines that are physically addicting. So there are, cer there are certain classes of medications that if you take them and you just abruptly stop them, your body can go into a withdrawal. And then there are other medications where you don't have a physical dependence on them, where you have a psychological dependence. So if you stop them, you're not going through a physical withdrawal, but your body goes back into insomnia and say, gosh, I can't go to sleep without that medicine. So you develop a psychological dependence. So it really depends on the medicine. So we have to be very clear, again, depending on the medicine, to tell them, well, maybe you just can't stop this abruptly. If you need to come off, there's a way to do it, but I can write out a schedule and I'll show you how to wean it gently. And the weaning of the medicine tends to do much, much better if you're also getting the psychological relaxation therapy as okay. well. All right, and speaking of getting a good night's sleep, here are some ways you can do just that. After your nightly rituals of washing your face, brushing your teeth, you head to bed. Healthy habits indeed. But do you also practice good sleep hygiene? Dr. Lois Cron, a sleep disorder specialist at Mayo Clinic, explains. Sleep hygiene, it's really talking about sleep lifestyle. What lifestyle choices can a person make that their sleep is as good as it could be? Dr. Cron says you can improve your sleep hygiene by avoiding caffeine and heavy meals before bed. She says to try to go to sleep about the same time every night so your body gets used to a routine. Finally, minimize your exposure to light before bed. That includes the glow coming off your favorite technology. Turn off media 30 minutes to an hour before bed and skip the social media update when you settle in. Then make your room as dark and quiet as possible to help you fall asleep and stay asleep. Dr. Cron says sleep hygiene is... It's an odd term, but it really is just meant to to talk about what a person can control that improves the quality of their sleep. All right, so a lot of those, it's, it's great advice, but in actuality, a lot of it's hard to practice. I mean, you can't go to bed at the same time every night, especially if, say, you go to bed at 9.30 or 10 during the week, and then on the weekends, you're, you're up a little bit later, so. So, yeah, these are all good things that we tell people to do. They're the optimal things that you try to do. Sometimes you can do them on your own. Sometimes there are phone app applications that can help you. With my patients who have pretty serious insomnia, they do better on a one-to-one -one Cynthia where they're working with a psychologist who's trained specifically in doing it. So that's a very good example. So the classic example of the adolescent in college is they're going to sleep at one time during the week to get mm. up early for their classes in the morning, and then at, on the weekends they're going to sleep at you know three o'clock in the morning, and that just wreaks havoc on your internal clock. So even though you can't go to sleep at exactly the same time, it's good not to to change it dramatically from the weekends to to the uh, to the weekday, and I've gotten much better at that myself. It's taken a lot of hard work to do that. There are very significant things. They talked about caffeine. You know, a lot of things have caffeine that you don't even know that are in them. You know, people who drink energy. Uh, drinks during the day and as we get older sometimes caffeine can have an effect on you 10 hours later so you can have a cup of coffee for lunch and it can keep you from falling asleep at night mm -hmm. and again that depends on the patient we talk about naps you know naps aren't necessarily a bad thing but if you have insomnia what it can do is reset your clock so that you get this second wind phenomenon then you feel great and it's trouble falling asleep at night mm -hmm. so it really depends on the patient and what we're going to do so having a comfortable room having a comfortable temperature staying away from alcohol and caffeine and cigarettes are very, very important for sleep hygiene. Exercise, you and I talked about exercise off screen. Exercise is great for every single age, pregnant, non-pregnant, premenopausal, postmenopausal, men, women, but you don't want to exercise too close to the time that you're ready to fall asleep, typically. Right. So you want to make sure that you're not exercising like five minutes before you go to sleep because then it's revved you up. It's made you feel like, oh my gosh, I can't go to sleep. I want to be able to be able to fall asleep. So you want to exercise a couple of hours before you're going to fall asleep. Now, can insomnia cause a stroke? So we talked about sleep apnea, and we talked about the fragmentation of sleep apnea, where you were getting these sympathetic nervous system jolts that jerk you from one stage of sleep and are fragmenting your sleep. Now, the literature shows that now we think that not only sleep apnea, but anything that's interrupting your sleep can predispose you to high blood pressure, heart disease, and stroke. So. If insomnia is interrupting your sleep and you're not getting a good night's sleep, that can absolutely contribute to, uh, to uh, different illnesses like high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, all those different sorts of things. Okay, well we know with age comes wisdom, but can it also change your sleep patterns? Watch how aging can affect your sleep.
Everybody's different when it comes to sleep, right? Correct. But generally there are sleep patterns depending on age throughout your life. So one of the myths is people will often say, hey, I've gotten older, I don't need as much sleep. Okay. And that's actually a myth. You need just as much sleep, but you're not very good at it anymore. So we uh -huh. become less efficient at our sleep. And so as we get older, we may take more naps during the day, sleep more less, less efficiently rather at night. And what I tell people is just think about your total. And the, I'll give you a perfect example. My father just turned 89. And he just said to me, I was, had dinner with him last night, and he said, thank you for making me not feel guilty about taking naps during the day. And now that he's been taking naps because he doesn't sleep quite as well as he'd like to at night, and we obviously don't want to give him medications to do that, that with different side effects, he's taking his nap when he needs it, he's able to sleep okay at night, and when you look at his total sleep for the 24 hours, it's just fine, and he feels fine, and he's functioning just fine. So naps so, are good. Yeah, so naps are okay. In a younger person, if they say, gee, I take a long nap, and then I can't fall asleep at night, then that's not so good. But if you're functioning just fine, sometimes naps are a good thing. All right, all right. And some people take naps and then they don't feel refreshed. We'll talk Correct. about that yeah. coming up. Also, you probably know or might know someone who walks in their sleep or acts out their dreams. It may seem a little scary, but it is treatable. We're going to talk about that coming up. Our website, it's so easy to remember, allhealthallthetime.com. Go there and give us any questions you may have for our experts and find out more about the Health Channel on South Florida's PBS. We'll be right back. Intoing is basically when your child comes in and walks with their feet pointing towards the midline. Most people walk with feet out about 10 degrees, pigeon toes with the foot inside. Intoing is very common. It's by far one of the most common reasons uh, for us to see patients in the office. Uh, but most pediatricians do a very good job at telling you if there's, if there's something more that needs to be done. It can come from three different places. It can come from your thigh bone, your tibia, or your foot. And any one of those things can be curved to cause the foot to progress forward. We now know that this condition improves on its own. Uh, it doesn't cause any lasting issues, no arthritis, no other joint issues or bony issues. And uh, the bracing can actually cause weakness that can maybe even delay the progress of them getting better on their own. More than 90% of these kids will outgrow this, absolutely. The Alter-G can be used for everything from athletic population, from young kids, high school, college, professional athletes, all the way to our older populations coming in with hip replacements, knee replacements. When you get into the treadmill, they wear a special spandex pants that has a zipper on it. You zip them in. When we turn on the treadmill, it fills up with air. It goes through a little process where it kind of gauges how much the patient weighs. It starts you at 100%, and then from there, we bring them down at that point. I run track and cross country at St. Brennan and my knee, I started getting knee pain in like January. So I stopped training and I started coming here. It's been good because I've been able to start running before I can actually get cleared. So it takes like the weight off my body. So it doesn't hurt as much when I run. And it's, I can start running and getting used to like the motions and everything again before I can actually go out and train hard. When the patient gets in it, usually they're always a little bit apprehensive, um, but in general, the patients usually like it a lot. 
Welcome back to the Health Channel, all health, all the time. I'm Cynthia Dimas on the commercials. I'm getting personal free advice from the doctor right here. Short naps are better than long naps. That's what I just learned. Let's move on now to nightmares, night terrors, sleepwalking, just some of the types of parasomnia disorder. Parasomnia, correct? Good. So parasomnia, P-A-R-A, -A, somnia. Okay. So parasomnia, P-A-R-A -A means around. Somnia means sleep. So the definition is doing something in and around sleep that you don't normally want to do. And the okay. classic example is sleepwalking. Okay, let's go through a few images we have here and okay. you tell me what's uh, what's going on here, Dr. Grant. Okay. We'll so. pop up the first image if we have it ready. Okay. Oh, so these are uh, these are uh, all my, these are cases that I've actually seen. Okay. So I see this fellow and he says to me, uh, he's coming to see me because they thought he had sleep apnea. Okay. And the reason is, is because he's getting interrupted sleep all the time. And he snores, but they've done three different sleep studies on him, and he doesn't have sleep apnea, and the doctors just say, there's nothing we can do for you. So I sit down, and I'm talking to him the way that I usually do, and I take a long time saying, hey, so just run me through. What do you do when you go to sleep? How do you go to sleep? Where do you sleep? What do you do? How do you feel when you wake up? And he says, well, hey, doc, I've got this ritual where I take a rope, and I strap it around my shoulder, and then I tie it around my bedpost, and I cinch it up, and I try to go to sleep like that because I sleep in a little apartment behind my sister's house. And I say, well, gosh, why, why? why are you tying the rope up like that? Why are you doing that? <laughs> he says, well, I was doing these things where I had gotten up and I had broken three TV sets before. I had, oh my throw, I had thrown them across the room. Oh my gosh. I had broken lamps and I had done all these things at night. And I said, gosh, I think you have what's called REM sleep behavior disorder. So REM is when you sleep. Rapid eye movement sleep is when you sleep and you dream. And, he's and normally, out. yeah, you're acting out this dream, and that's abnormal. So what people don't realize, remember I said you go through these different stages of yeah. sleep. Well, when you go into REM sleep, your body is paralyzed. People don't realize that. Your eyes are moving, your heart is beating, you can breathe, but you're not moving your arms and your legs purposely because you don't want to do something that hurts you. And we only dream for a few minutes at a time, and then it cycles in and out. So what do you do? Well, normally, you don't act out the dream, but in some people, especially men over the age of 50, instead of just having the dream, they can act out the dream. Okay. And the classic story is we'll talk about that, but there are medicines that we can do to treat it, and we want to make sure that you don't have sleep apnea, because sleep apnea can trigger it the way that we talked about earlier. And you don't want to mix alcohol with different things, because alcohol is a classic trigger as well, because what alcohol can do is it makes sleep apnea worse because it's a respiratory suppressant and it's a muscle relaxant. Mm -hmm. And it can fragment your sleep as well. So there are many different things that we can do to prevent it. And sometimes just an over-the-counter. There's recent literature that says just taking melatonin, over-the-counter melatonin, uh, uh, can help prevent these things from happening. So the guy who so was ha tied up his hand, you treated him with so medication. These are, these are classic cases that are just amazing. And often, just by the first dose that we give patients, they often never have another episode ever. They're doing very well. And sometimes we have to okay. adjust the medicines and do different things. But there are a lot of different things that we can do to prevent them from happening. And so he probably sleeps a lot better now, I'm sure. 55-year-old yeah. retired police officer. Let's <laughs> take a look at this image right here. So this is an amazing case. This is an actual case as well. This is a patient that comes to me because the husband's sitting next to her and he says, listen, doc, uh, I wake up and my wife is over me with a scissors. Oh, Like out knife. of the movie Psycho, yeah. where she's waving the scissors like, Jesus, yeah, oh my God, I'm, she's going to stab me. <laughs> so I say, well, tell me some other things that you've done. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that she would get up and wrap Christmas presents, but it was July. She would, oh. she would eat cleaning fluid and drink cleaning fluid. Oh, no. She would get in her pajamas in the middle of the night and take a shower with her pajamas on. She would eat and cook in the middle of the night. And so I say to him, gosh, like, what do you do to try to prevent this? And we're going to show on this slide. So what do you do to try to prevent this? So he says, listen, I have this interesting thing that I do. I have these Christmas jingle bells that I have. Uh -huh. And I tie it around her waist. And so then I tie a rope from the jingle bells all the way to the dining room table. And so if she moves in the middle of the night, I can hear the jingle bells, and I know and I she's know. not going to go get the scissors and kill me in the middle of the night. Wow. And she did great again with treatment as well. She ended up having many different sleep disorders, and we treated her very effectively, and she's done extremely well. So if you're tying your hand up <laughs> so you don't move, or you're putting jingle bells on your wife, it's time to see a, a specialist. Right. If you're jingling without jingle bells, then that's it. So the, the simple answer is, I mean, these things sound entertaining and, and kind of funny at times, but they but can be serious. devastating right. to families, and they can be very dangerous. They can be associated 
associated with other neurologic illnesses that are very important to make sure that they're not associated with other neurologic illnesses and other sleep disorders. Uh, but they can be frightening and terrifying to other family members, obviously, but they're very treatable, and that's the secret. Sometimes people are embarrassed to talk about them because they're these horrific things that they're doing in the middle of the night. I had somebody who believed he was playing football back in college, mm -hmm. and he would yell touchdown and then fly out of bed and smash into the wall. Oh. So uh, anyway, all these interesting stories. So. Uh, uh, they're very, very treatable, and people are very, very grateful because, again, often the treatment is very effective very early. What's the most bizarre story you've heard? So one of the most bizarre stories I heard is somebody who had, uh, he was seeing this um, imaginary figure oh. who was uh, a, a Jabberwocky who was uh, saying things, and, and he jabber, was also... what's that? Well, he was seeing another creature who was uh, seeing... Uh, the com he was seeing this imaginary creature that was attacking him and crawling out of graves in the middle of the oh night. Oh my gosh! And so, he was imagining literally like the like the like the video of Michael Jackson of oh, yeah, Thriller, Thriller, where these yeah. gr these demons zombies. are coming. Yeah, these zombies are coming out of the graves, and he's reaching out and and going for his wife and trying to protect his wife. And, and she says, my God, why are you grabbing me? Why are you pushing me? And he says, oh, honey, I'm so sorry. There were these zombies. I was trying to protect you from the zombies. So I see these interesting stories all the time. But you can't, and control, the, you can't control the dreams, though, right? Well, I mean, no, interestingly, often when you try to, the, one of the herald things is people start having these vivid dreams. Mm -hmm. They start having these things that are heralding that, oh, my gosh, they may have this. And often by treating it, the, the dreams quiet down, the things quiet down. And, and the most important thing is they don't act out the dream. Okay. And, and another, uh, oh, I'll show you because I think we're going to talk about this, this case. This is a 46-year-old yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. health professional. Take a look at this. Now, what so is this going is, on here? This is talk about bizarre stories. So oh. this, this, woman, this woman tells me that, again, I'm kind of giggling, but it's terrifying. Right. And fortunately, her husband was treated very well. She tells me, literally, she yeah. wakes up in the middle of the night. Her husband is strangling her. Oh my God! And she's reaching over for the telephone, and she has 911 on the phone telling her the 911 operator, "My husband's trying to strangle me," and and he is his story is, "Oh my gosh, honey, he's this mild-mannered guy. They've been married forever. He's never done anything violent in his whole life." And he's saying, "My God, I thought there was a burglar in the house, and I was trying to protect you from the burglar." And that's actually a classic textbook story: is they're trying to protect their loved one, but they act out the dream and actually end up uh, hurting the loved one. So we have to be very cautious. Sometimes we have the loved one sit or the bed partner sleep in a separate bedroom until everything's well controlled. But again, the important thing is this is something, so if you're doing any violent behavior, we talked about snoring, we talked about leg movements, we talked about those things. But if you're doing anything violent or potentially injurious in the middle of the night, Cynthia, it's important to make sure that you see a sleep specialist because we can treat these things. And you treat it with medication. With medication. And the medication does what, essentially? Well, we want to make sure that it's not something else like sleep apnea. Okay. We want to make sure that it's not another neurologic illness, which it can be. But the medication helps quiet down the parts of the brain that activate these abnormal dream enactments. Okay. And they work very effectively. I see. What is yeah. the best advice you can give people who are having problems sleeping? So the best advice I can say is try to have good sleep habits. Don't think that sleep is not important to you because it's very, very important. And even if you can just increase your, the most common reason why people are sleepy during the day, mm -hmm. Cynthia, is they don't get enough sleep. Yeah. That sounds so common sense. And sometimes you know that people aren't getting enough sleep because they'll say, gosh, on the weekends I sleep longer, when I'm on vacation I sleep longer. Uh, and so if you, often you can just increase your sleep by half an hour or, or an hour, that can make all the difference in the world, trying to have good sleep hygiene, and then making sure that if you have the things we talked about, snoring, abnormal behavior, anything violent, make sure you tell your doctor that you'd like to see a sleep specialist. Let's just touch really quickly because I think a lot of people think, oh, I need a drink or two before I go to bed. I need a glass of, you know, wine or, or whatever it might be, a scotch of vodka. What does this do? So a lot of people will use alcohol to help them get to sleep because it does make people sleepy. Yeah. If you think about it, gosh, alcohol makes you sleepy. They say, gee, that's great. And a lot of people do that. But there are a lot of dangers for that. So one of the dangers we just talked about a little while ago is alcohol is a muscle relaxant, so it makes sleep apnea worse. It tells your brain actually you don't need to breathe. So if you look at all of, this, all of the movie stars who have dropped dead in the middle of the night from mm -hmm. overdoses, it's because they were mixing alcohol and sleeping pills. And what it does is it tells your brain, you're so sleepy, you don't have to breathe. Oh boy. Just don't breathe. And these people typically die of what's called a respiratory arrest because they just stop breathing in the middle of the night.
So the important thing is if you're going to if you're going to drink alcohol, have it earlier in the evening with dinner. Don't have it so close to the time that you're going to bed. And when do you know it's time to seek help from a professional? So again, uh, the different ways that you know that it's time to see a sleep doctor is again, if you're snoring, gasping, choking, if you feel unrefreshed during the daytime, you feel excessively sleepy during the daytime, if you're kicking your legs or doing anything violent at night. Okay, and people go through cycles, so it might not be happening now, could happen later. Absolutely, That's doesn't, have to ha doesn't have to be every night. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Grant. Well, thank you. All right, and it's he been does. A pleasure. And by the way, he sleeps on the job. I found that out, right? Yes, I take naps. I take naps. They help me. Nothing. The doctor says there's nothing wrong with sleeping on the job. Yeah, right. right <laughs> Thirty minutes. Right, right. Thirty minutes. Okay, I'm, I'm ready for my nap right now. Thank you so much, Dr. Okay. Grant. Thank you, Cynthia. That's going to do it. It's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much to Dr. Grant for giving so, us so much insight and helping us sleep and feel better. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Health Channel. All health, all the time.com is our website. I'm Cynthia Demas, and I will see you next time. Goodbye, everyone.